Welcome to this session on China, US relations, uh, how things are looking with a new administration of the United States. To speak about this, it's a real pleasure to uh, have David Dollar with us. Uh, David is very well known in the economics profession. I've been familiar with his work for, for many years since he was at the World Bank. He's currently the senior fellow at the John L. Fortin, Fortin uh, China Center at the Brookings Institution. Um, from 2009 to 2013, he was the US Treasury's economic and financial emissary uh, in Beijing, uh, involved in facilitating the macroeconomic and financial policy dialogue between the US and China. Prior to that, David worked for 20 years at the World Bank, as I said, serving as, amongst many other things, as country director for China and Mongolia, based in Beijing for five years. So a very extensive uh, direct experience of China, um, and his most recent book is also on, the, on that subject, China at 2049, Economic Challenges of a Rising Global Power, a uh, timely book. So with that, David is going to talk for about half an hour on a the whole range of, of China-US uh, relation issues. And he will then welcome your questions and comments after that for about another 30 minutes. The entire event is on the record and we very much look forward to your presentation, David, over to you. Thank you very much. It's really a great pleasure to join uh, by video and I wish I could be there with you all in person in Dublin. That would have been a delightful long weekend. So my topic is US-China relations in the wake of the 2020 election. And I have to emphasize that there's still tremendous uncertainty about the positions of the new Biden administration, the policy positions, and he's named many key staff, uh, but lots of positions, staff positions remain to be filled. So we can speculate and identify a few things, but I do wanna emphasize the uncertainty. If I were picking a headline for this or a summary for the talk, I would say, I do not expect any immediate dramatic change in US-China relations, but I expect subtle changes that over time will be quite significant. So I wanna divide the talk into five topics. First, I think one of the clearest things about the incoming administration is that it's gonna put more attention on global public goods. President-elect Biden has made it clear that he'll rejoin the Paris Accord on Climate Change, the World Health Organization. Uh, he wants to get back into the UN deal on Iran and strengthen and extend that. And in dealing with these global public goods, he will inevitably have to deal with China. The US and China are the two biggest economies in the world. They're the two biggest emitters of carbon. There's no way we get to net zero by 2050 if the US and China are not each strongly pursuing policies toward carbon reduction. It doesn't mean we have to cooperate closely necessarily, it doesn't mean we have to be friends, but we are gonna be working together on global issues. And I would argue that was completely missing from the Trump administration. And in some ways it sets a floor on the relationship. We have to work together on these global issues and that does kind of put a limit on, on the hostile things you can say and do to each other if we're actually going to make progress on those global issues. And I agree with President-elect Biden. This is really, you know, th these are really the challenging issues, especially climate change. While I'm talking global public goods, I would also like to add in, I think, a less well-known one. Uh, clearly, this coronavirus recession has had a devastating effect on developing countries. A lot of developing countries have excessive debt. We already have a debt service suspension initiative affecting the poorest countries and China, the US, the rest of the G20 are cooperating in that in a fairly effective way. Probably needs to be extended, probably needs more, but it's a good start. The main problem, it's really just focused on the poorest countries so there are a lot of large emerging markets that are simply not involved in that. And in a lot of those countries, there are gonna be debt problems. China's the largest official creditor to many countries. 
The U.S. is the largest shareholder in the IMF, which takes the lead in addressing these kind of uh, financial issues. Uh, so I think of that as another global public good. If we don't cooperate on third world debt crises, we're going to have spread of those crises. We're going to have terrible economic results. It's going to be hard for the rest of the world to grow. So, so that first point, I think, is, is good news in a way for the world that the U.S. is back in terms of dealing with global issues. And that will inevitably put us working together with China, uh, common objectives on, on many of these issues. Now, the second point I wanna make is that President-elect Biden has made it clear that he wants to reestablish US relations with our allies, move away from the America first policy of President Trump, and I think the key allies are our European friends like Ireland and the EU more broadly, uh, and in the UK now that it's left the EU. And then in Asia, Japan, South Korea, Australia, New Zealand, these are key allies of the United States. And in talking about reestablishing those relationships, Biden's team has made it clear that that includes trying to develop a common approach to China. Now that involves a lot of different issues. I think we will see more attention paid to human rights issues in China, Xinjiang, Hong Kong, what's happening with Taiwan. Some members of President Trump's cabinet have spoken out about these issues, but according to John Bolton's book, President Trump himself was not in, very engaged and didn't in some sense encourage President Xi Jinping of China uh, to uh, pursue authoritarian measures in these areas. I think you'll see a more consistent policy now among Europe, the United States, our Asia Pacific allies. Now our allies are a diverse group. So working more closely with them across a broad range of issues is not necessarily gonna be a simple thing. Certainly the Asia Pacific allies would like to see the US continue to have a strong security presence in the Asia Pacific. So continue to do freedom of navigation operations through the South China Sea and push back in some sense against Chinese activity in the South China Sea or along the India-China border. I'm not, I'm not gonna presume to understand that well how European partners uh, view that though there is talk certainly talk within NATO uh, that China's rise is one of the preeminent security issues of the time. Now, if you think about the first two issues I highlighted, it starts to reveal the complexity of the US, of the challenge of dealing with China because the US and Europe, other partners working together on global public goods, that's something that China should welcome uh, because that's the only way we're going to deal with issues like climate change and the next pandemic and third world debt crises. On the other hand, China is not really that comfortable with the U.S. alliance system, thinks of that as a Cold War relic. Uh, and I think, the, to be frank, I think the Chinese administration welcomed that aspect of the Trump policy uh, that the U.S. was moving away from its traditional alliances. So thinking about things from China's point of view, uh, the first two issues I raised are kind of a wash uh, where China should welcome the first thing I brought up, but then not be so happy about the strengthening of the US alliance system. Now, the third issue I would bring up is that I'm gonna start getting into economics, but I'll, I'll, quite a few of the things that have been done that have an economic effect in the relationship have, done, have been done for security reasons. So for example, the United States has put Huawei on our so-called entities list. We're preventing uh, American companies from selling high-tech inputs to Huawei. We've taken the extraordinary step of preventing the Taiwan Semiconductor Company based in Taiwan you know, we're preventing them from using previously purchased American equipment to make chips that they sell to Huawei. Uh, and I, I believe some other Chinese purchasers are involved. Uh, 
we just recently put out a list of firms that that are aiding the development of the Chinese military. And many of the firms on that list are, you know, obvious defense contractors. And that kind of firm has very little interaction with the US. So uh, sanctioning those firms is more symbolic. Uh, but the list also includes the three big Chinese telecom companies, right? China Mobile, for example, is on this list. Uh, and the sanctions at the moment are not that strong. The key new sanction introduced just in the last few weeks is that Americans like myself, you know, we cannot buy securities of these firms. And for a firm like China Mobile, it's included in a number of popular stock market indices about Chinese stocks or emerging market stocks. So the most popular exchange traded fund dealing with emerging market stocks owns a piece of China Mobile, and that's now going to be illegal for Americans to own that. So either Americans are going to have to divest out of that popular uh, security, or else that exchange traded fund is going to have to rearrange its portfolio and divest itself of, of China Mobile. So you know, we're, we're seeing a lot of actions like that. Uh, that clearly have some economic impact, uh, but all of which are justified on security ground. Now, I think, and I would add that some of the things I just mentioned have been introduced by executive order uh, since the election, okay? And it is frankly unusual in the United States for an outgoing administration to be doing major executive orders after it's lost an election as it's leaving, uh, you could argue that some of this is being done in bad faith, you know, tossing a bunch of hand grenades uh, as you exit from the White House. So uh, th this is the first of a number of very complicated issues that the Biden administration is gonna have to face. Uh, I would not expect them to reverse all of these security measures. I think we can be pretty sure they won't reverse all of these security measures, things like putting Huawei on the entity list, which was done a couple of years ago, uh, some of the other uh, sanctions of, of uh, high-tech firms. Uh, I think President-elect Biden and his team, they're gonna wanna maintain uh, so some of these measures that are aimed at protecting national security. And they would certainly come under bipartisan criticism if they moved away from all of those measures. On the other hand, the fact that a lot of this stuff is being put in place right now uh, after President Trump lost the election raises questions about bad faith. So I would expect the administration to do a careful review of these different measures. And this is an area where I think it's easy to state rhetorically what the ideal policy should be. Uh, but harder to implement. Rhetorically, I like the phrase from the former US Treasury Secretary, Hank Paulson, uh, who said that in this, this area of, you could think of it as technology competition or national security related technologies, the United States needs to have a small yard with a high fence. And what he means by that is we should identify a relatively small number of critical technologies that have national security implications and put up pretty serious walls, meaning pretty serious obstacles about investment, mergers and acquisitions, the selling of US high technology to relevant Chinese firms, uh, et cetera. But then a part of that whole idea is that the yard would be relatively small and that you would leave most of the rest of the economy open for trade and investment back and forth between China. And I think you may have heard this phrase decoupling, this word decoupling. Um, I think the idea from Secretary Paulson is that there's inevitably going to be a certain amount of decoupling in some specific technology areas that have security implications. Uh, but from his point of view, you wanna keep that relatively small 
And then you want to have uh, open exchange essentially among the United States, China, other major economies. So I agree with that kind of assessment, which, which you get from quite a few thinkers in both our main political parties, that any kind of radical or complete decoupling between the US and China is completely unrealistic. Uh, for, for one thing, our allies, especially Asia Pacific allies are never gonna go along with that. Probably Germany wouldn't go along with that <clears throat> among our European friends uh, because people are firms and workers are benefiting from the trade with China. Uh, and I don't think the key allies of the US have given up on the idea of integrating China into the global economic system. <clears throat> so as I said, relatively easy to state the principle, uh, harder, uh, you know, now lots of different types of firms are getting put on sanctions lists by the United States. And so I think the Biden team will take a, a hard look at that. And the end result will probably be uh, some of that will be dropped, I would guess. Some of these things that were added at the last minute uh, as the Trump team is exiting the White House. Uh, but quite a bit of that will end up staying. Uh, the Americans, you know, the, the general attitude toward China has definitely hardened and Americans are worried about potential threat from China. And so you will see uh, some of that national security related trade and investment sanctions, some of that will definitely stay in place. <clears throat> now, the fourth issue I'm gonna raise is the more general economic trade relations between the US and China. And, and you notice that I'm more than halfway through my talk and I, before I'm really just getting to talking about economics. Uh, and to be frank, that's deliberate. I think it's just not the most important issue in the US-China economic relations. I think the global public goods, security issues, human rights, uh, to me, all of these are arguably more important than the economic relations. Uh, and to be frank, the economic relations right now are a complete mess. And so I think President Trump is leaving President Biden with a very difficult situation. Uh, and obviously the US has lots of domestic challenges at the moment. The COVID pandemic is accelerating. The economy seems to be slowing down and needs more stimulus. We infrastructure, there's broad agreement on a need for some kind of infrastructure plan, more family friendly policies. So you can count on the Biden team to be focusing on these more domestic issues uh, in the, certainly in the first half year, probably throughout most of the first year. Uh, and I think economic relations with China are just not gonna be that high on the list of priorities. So what is this mess I'm referring to? Well, at the moment, the US has a 25% tariff on about half of our imports from China. It's a pretty significant distortion. In order to avoid further escalation of that, China agreed to a phase one trade deal. The heart of the phase one trade deal is Chinese commitment to buy more goods and services from the US. And economists like myself, we felt the, the deal when it was announced nearly one year ago now, seemed completely unrealistic. Uh, it would have involved China importing 40% more than last year uh, during 2020, and then an additional 40 plus percent increase in 2021. You know, we don't normally see macro variables growing at those kind of rates. And it turns out it certainly has not materialized during 2020. At the moment, China has imported through October about half of what would be necessary to meet the target for 2020. Obviously, we've had the coronavirus pandemic and recession. There are a lot of reasons. There were very specific targets. China was supposed to buy $50 billion of energy, uh, but shortly after the deal was signed, you know, global recession started, energy prices dropped. Uh, US firms are cutting back production. They were not particularly interested in selling to China at the prices that were prevailing in the middle of 2020. One of the big exports from the US to China 
is the fact that there are been, have been about 400,000 Chinese students in the US, mostly in universities, mostly paying full tuition, plus Chinese tourists. You know, that was all supposed to increase under this phase one deal, but of course it's contracted dramatically because of the, the cutoff in travel between the United States and China. Uh, so basically that phase one deal, yeah, it's, it's not really being implemented. Um, and I think that, you know, this is the kind of situation that President Biden inherits. The, his team, including uh, Vice President-elect Kamala Harris, fairly recently, have been criticizing the tariffs. Federal Reserve staff did a study that the U.S. tariffs on China have cost the U.S. about 175,000 manufacturing jobs. You know, it always always seems like a good idea. Let's, you know, let, let's uh, restrict Chinese imports and protect our industry. Well, global value chains are very complicated. U.S. firms import a lot of parts and components from China, and the 25% tariff ended up being slapped on a lot of those, and then that hurts American firms, and then they lose customers because prices are going up. They lose exports because they become less competitive. They also lose exports because China, of course, retaliated uh, in response to the U.S. tariffs. So U.S. has not really gotten anything very positive out, out of that. Uh, but President-elect Biden just did an interview with the journalist Tom Friedman, Tom Friedman uh, and he made it clear he's not going to eliminate those tariffs, certainly not on day one and not as an early move in his administration. Basically, I think the Biden team is going to leave that protection in place, uh, let it play out for a while. You know, I emphasize domestic priorities are going to be number one, and that's a big agenda. Also, I think we can count on the Biden team getting rid of remaining tariffs that have been imposed on allies uh, in you know, in steel, aluminum, and various sectors. And I think that'll be very welcome. And I think that would be a good statement from the administration is to get rid of the tariffs that have been imposed on various allies uh, as part of this America First policy. But then, as I said, President Biden, President-elect Biden has made it clear he'll leave the tariffs in China, tariffs on China in place for the moment. Now, I do think there's an opportunity for China to come with a proposal. Uh, and, and any proposal from the Chinese side will probably be met with some skepticism in the US because we've been negotiating over these issues for a long time. My own view is there's been gradual progress in things like intellectual property rights protection, opening up more, more markets. China has opened up financial services and automobiles. There are other sectors that are relatively protected in China. Uh, there's still issues about state enterprise discipline, you know, the penalties for intellectual property rights violations. There are a number of practical areas where China could come with a proposal uh, and, and uh, essentially put out an offer to move substantially on some of these substructural issues uh, in return for the US phasing out the tariffs on the Chinese products. So the potential is there for a deal, but I don't see the Biden team taking the lead in trying to bring that about quickly because they'll be distracted by other things and because the whole economic relationship with China continues to be quite controversial in the United States. Now, the last point I wanna make is indirectly related to China. So, you know, leaving aside U.S.-China economic relations for the moment, there's the issue of the U.S. trade relation with the rest of the world. And I think the easy part of that is eliminating tariffs on products from allies, as I said. Also, the U.S. has been blocking the dispute settlement process in the World Trade Organization. Uh, I think we can get a compromise to uh, to allow the WTO to start functioning as part, you know, 
part of that US kind of returning to international organizations. But President-elect Biden has made it clear that he would approach very cautiously any big new trade agreement. And that would include any talk about rejoining the Trans-Pacific Partnership, uh, which President Trump dropped out of on day one. And I do think, you know, that politically, large trade agreements have become very difficult for the US. Under President Trump, you've definitely got some pretty strong protectionist elements within the Republican Party. There were always some protectionist elements within the Democratic Party. Uh, so now you have a kind of unholy alliance uh, cutting across our parties, questioning the value of trade agreements. And I think, again, with domestic priorities taking first place, the easy thing will not be to pursue any new major trade agreements. Uh, first time President Biden goes to Asia, first time he talks to Japan, South Korea, I think he'll be hearing from these traditional American partners that they feel that the US is withdrawing economically from Asia. China uh, is one of the 15 countries that reached agreement on RCEP, the Regional Comprehensive Economic Program. Uh, this is really an ASEAN initiative. I think ASEAN should get a lot of credit for bringing this to fruition. It's the first trade agreement, including China, Japan, and South Korea. It also has Australia and New Zealand. You can criticize it as relatively shallow because mostly it's, it's tariff cutting without dealing with the new issues of cross-border data flows or intellectual property rights protection. But I think it'll solidify a lot of value chains in Asia and centered very much around China. So, so this talk about getting value chains to leave China and reshore to the United States, I think mostly that's completely unrealistic. Uh, you will have some evolution of value chains as more labor intensive parts of the value chain leave China, move to Southeast Asia, because wages are going up in China. China is now becoming uh, one of the higher wage countries in Asia. Uh, and it can be a very healthy process for those chains to evolve, but China is not gonna be left out. China's producing a lot of the machinery and the more sophisticated components. So an important milestone in 2020 is that ASEAN moved into first place as China's number one trading partner. The EU is number two and the United States has dropped to number three. And I think in the current environment, a lot of uh, political elites in the US are probably perfectly happy to be dropping down on that list of Chinese trading partners. Uh, but China is going ahead, developing trade agreements. It's negotiating a bilateral investment treaty with, with uh, the EU. Uh, and there is definitely a risk that the US uh, is being left out of those, of those agreements. So let me wrap up by just emphasizing how complicated this all is. If you think about the US administration pursuing relations with China, I started with what I view as relatively positive news that the, we wanna to work together with China and other partners on global issues that's been missing. We also wanna rebuild our traditional alliances. European friends should be happy to hear that. But again, we have to see the details the US has to be willing to compromise on various issues if that's gonna be meaningful. I think some of the technology stuff is the most complicated. And I worry that wherever there's a question, we're gonna to opt toward protectionism uh, on a kind of precautionary principle. Uh, and, and that would be unfortunate because uh, I, I think we're still better off with an integrated global economy. Don't expect the US to rush to actually sort out the trade relations between the US and China. There are other priorities, but if under some scenarios within two years or so, I could see the US coming back, uh, for example, into the Trans-Pacific Partnership, not, not right away, of course, uh, but perhaps two years down the road, particularly depending on what President-elect Biden hears uh, from his allies in the Asia Pacific and in Europe. So managing 
that very, very complex relationship with China, I, I, I do think that really is the biggest challenge that the United States faces. And arguably it's the biggest challenge that the European Union faces as well. Uh, so hopefully we can, we can work together. Let, let's start by having a good frank exchange of ideas. Thank you very much. Thank you.